This is what I call the coronary artery calcium story. It started for me with looking at histologic segments. This is a non-decalcified coronary artery segment stained with something called a mason goldner trichrome stain. The area of the lumen you can see identified is very, very minimal. There are also areas of yellowing, which in fact is what we call gruel, or you would know it better as lipid in Greek. You'll also notice that there are other areas with green bifringent. These are the areas of the mason goldner trichrome stain, which picks up what's called calcium hydroxyapatite. Next to this is a contact microradiograph of exactly the same coronary section. You'll see here in particular the areas of calcium hydroxyapatite correspond directly with areas of calcification noted in the same histologic segment. This then indi the indicates the standard association of coronary calcification seen on x-ray with the actual finding of calcium hydroxyapatite. We then began to look along the segments of the coronary arteries. Here is shown one example of non-decalcified coronary segments looking at the plaque area and the calcification area in the same contact microradiograph. You'll see in particular here that there are situations in which there is no evidence for coronary calcification, and yet there is distinct evidence for atherosclerotic plaque. On the other hand, as you follow this, you can see that there is what we call a DC bias or offset bias. And in fact, some areas will show areas of coronary calcification that are as much as 50% of the atherosclerotic plaque area in any given segment. We then generally felt that the average or median of this was about 20% of the coronary atherosclerotic plaque burden was realized by looking at coronary artery calcification. This then led to the next development of looking at this as an iceberg concept. You know, an iceberg sits largely under the water with only 20% exposed above the water. The other 80% lies beneath that cannot be seen. But the visualized area of the calcification or the area of the iceberg above the surface can be appreciated by analogy. Again, we found about 0% of the plaque could be found in some areas to as high as 50%. Our then summary was that about 20% of the atherosclerotic plaque burden was realized by coronary calcification. This then went off to the next segment. This is a coronary artery segment showing a normal vessel, although the appearance of fatty streaks can occur anywhere in early age, such as neonates up to age about 7 to 8. These are all protected theoretically by the single cell layer called the endothelium. As the endothelium protects the area, it then starts to protect from the flowing blood all of the foreign substances that may get into the vessel wall. As this can erode with time based on all of the traditional risk factors, some of the elements can get inside the coronary artery vessel itself and produce an inflammatory situation, very much like getting a splinter in your finger and resulting in white blood cell, macrophage, and other things. As they gobble up these areas of these, they become foam cells, and it creates more and more infl inflammation. Calcification ends up being a relatively early event in the process in which it tries to contain the amount of inflammation. This is very similar to what we see in traditional things such as formations of coronary to, excuse me, as uh, lung granulomas. Now, as this then proceeds, the calcification continues in the area of the inflammation. The progression of the calcification, whether it's in a particular site or in multiple sites, ends up being an indicator or a surrogate for the amount of atherosclerotic plaque, as noted in the previous discussions. 
coronary remodeling, positive remodeling occurs, and we have no compromise to the lumen as we're having the development of plaque. Thus, there are no symptoms in these early situations. The next step, the final step, if you will, comes in with the development of layer upon layer in which we have now negative remodeling as opposed to the positive remodeling, and the lumen eventually becomes narrowed, and this can develop into typical angina pectoris, representing late advanced atherosclerotic plaque. In between, as you know, are other steps. In particular, the dilated, remodeled coronary artery can begin to have some erosion in its layers and actually put forth all of this foreign material into the flowing blood. The flowing blood then reacts as if this is a cut to the surface and it brings in platelets which attempt to stabilize the area. If you can stabilize it, you can form another layer and another layer, eventually leading to something that could result in a, in a significant obstruction. But many times this becomes a situation in which the platelet activity is hyper uh, extended and we have a situation where a myocardial infarction may occur. So the development of atherosclerotic plaque over time over the years begins with uh, intact endothelium. It then ends up with resulting damage to the endothelium and what we might consider a foreign body reaction into the wall including the development of coronary artery calcification. This process is a long uh, relatively unknown is the positive remodeling, but once we start getting erosion into the uh, area of the lumen, then we have a problem.